this session will focus on informed choices and decisions that are made um, through the informed consent process and um, some of the challenges that come up for patients and I would say also for uh, clinicians in the, um, in the testing process. My name is Patricia Marshall and I'm a professor of bioethics and anthropology here at CASE and I'm co-director of our Center for Research, Genetic Research Ethics and Law that's funded by N NIHGR and um, Rich is a co-director along with me. Um, here is the process and how it will work. I'm going to introduce Ruth Farrell, who you've already met, um, and after she gives her presentation, then I'll introduce our panelists and we'll have time for discussion after the panelists. So Ruth Farrell, Dr. Farrell, is a friend and colleague of mine and of many of us here in the room. Um, Ruth is a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in, at Cleveland Clinic, also in the Department of Ethics and Humanities and Spirituality at the clinic, and in um, the, I, I call it the genomic, it's genomic medicine, correct? Thank you very much. So come on down. Hello again, now I get to be a speaker and not a moderator. Thank goodness I'm off the hot seat. So I want to talk to you about informed decision making. We use the term informed consent, but I want to take you a little bit towards informed decision making. It speaks more to the process of making these decisions, getting, in the, getting the information and making the choices. Informed consent is a, it's, it's a related concept. It's more about action. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about the decision making process. Getting the information, making some of those choices, for, before perhaps even the chance you sign a form. Now I'm an OBGYN, and I'm aware of the importance of informed consent, informed decision making in my own practice. We know that this can help patients, it improves outcomes, safety, satisfaction, and the core of that is autonomy. By allowing patients to get information about the choices that they have, they can make decisions that reflect their values, their needs, their preferences. But I'm also a clinical researcher, which means I go into offices, talk to patients, ask them questions, try and find out what we can do better on the ground floor of the clinic. And as a re researcher, I found a new component of informed decision making that I want to share with you as well in the next couple minutes. Informed decision making and the translational pathway. Informed decision making is not just about what happens in the clinic but it's also a component of bringing new technologies to patients. As we're talking about new genetic technologies, that's why I wanted to raise this point. Without the ability to make an informed choice, an informed decision about testing options, patients' access or their willingness to use new technologies is limited, and we won't be able to reach the full potential of what some of these technologies can do to improve the health and well-being of patients. It's important because there's also the chance that without adequate information, Patients may opt for new tests that they don't really understand, and that can result in harms. The problem with that is both at the individual level for a patient, but also in terms of generating mistrust into the scientific environment and stopping the processes that actually move the translation process forward. So we're all here today to try and help our patients, help women make better decisions, navigate their options. So the goal is for patients to make informed decisions about the use of the prenatal genetic testing options, the ones that are here now, the ones that will be here in the future. And we'd like to avoid two outcomes. The first is the uninformed uptake, the notion that a patient proceeds with a test without an adequate understanding of what the test is about. This is the first area that brought me into research. In fact, as a brand new intern, I took care of a patient who had amniocentesis to evaluate a positive result on a quad check, a screening test, and um, she broke her water and she miscarried. So as the intern on the floor, I took care of her. She was there by herself. The process took a long time. We had the chance to talk. I learned she didn't understand what a quad check was for. She just wanted a healthy baby. She didn't know what a positive result meant. She didn't understand what amniocentesis really was or that there was a chance of miscarriage, though rare, can happen. 
And so this is what we want to try and avoid. The patient who says, I want the healthy baby, or my doctor wants me to do this test, and something goes wrong without understanding those risks. But as a researcher, I found another aspect of informed decision making that we also want to try and achieve. We want to avoid the uninformed decline, the idea that a patient refuses a test without adequate understanding. Let me give you an example of this. Perhaps there may be a test that a patient learns about, but she decides against it because she has heard the test is only to decide if you're going to terminate the pregnancy or not. So she decides not to do the test. But in fact, the value of the test may, may be that can give her information about the fetus to direct her prenatal care, to help her make plans and resources for a child who may have special needs in the future. So we want to avoid this as well. Our goal is to avoid the uninformed uptake, but also the uninformed decline that will be a barrier to using these new technologies. So let me step back for a minute and what talks about, well, let me talk about what makes an informed decision. I'm going to take a bird's eye view. I'm not going to try to not over, oversimplify this. But there are two sides of an informed decision. One is information. And one is values and preferences. You've heard some of the speakers talk about that already. So let me break this down and talk a little bit about information. What information? Usually when they talk about tests, the language goes straight to what this test can do. But there's a skip. You need to talk about the condition. What is the condition being tested for? Is it Down syndrome? Is it something else? What does it mean to have a child who may have this condition in terms of their childhood, their adult years? What resources or needs might they need? So it's important that patients understand what this condition is that they're having the test for. Then it's time to talk about the test. And this is where the standard rhetoric of informed consent often comes into play. Understanding the indications of a test, how a test is performed, the benefits, the risks, the disadvantages, the limitations, um, and also the alternatives. So this test, another test, no test. And when we talk about risks, it's important to recognize that the tests that we're talking about, the, the different prenatal screening tests, diagnostic tests, all have a different realm of risks. And it may not be miscarriage, as it was in the case of the patient I mentioned first. It may be worry. It may be stress. It may be concern. It may change the experience of her pregnancy. So we need to be certain our patients understand what risk means on that concept as well. It's not just about the test. It's the interpretation. So what is your test result going to tell you? Is it a chance? there's a 1 in 50 chance of having a, a fetus with a condition versus a 1 in 400? Or is it a yes or no? And finally, post-test options. So the idea is if you do the test, what are you going to do with the information? Tenant in medicine, don't do a test unless you know what you're going to do with the information. It's not just about getting this information. It's about understanding it. And when we look at studies from informed consent, this is where patients often struggle and physicians forget to ask those simple questions. Tell me in your own words what I just said. Can you explain it? Tell me back. It takes about 30 seconds, but it can make all the difference in the informed consent process. So let's talk about the values and preferences. We've already heard about how important some of these, these values and preferences are when you talk about prenatal genetic testing. The concepts of pregnancy, disability, termination, parenthood. Genetic testing and what that means for the current pregnancy children who may already be born, who may or may not have that condition or was not tested for, and future children as well. These are some of the most provocative, profound topics out there of discussion. And these are important parts of the discussion about whether or not a test would be of value. Let me give you an example. I had a patient who had her second trimester ultrasound, and a heart problem was noted, which might be a, a soft marker for Down syndrome. She didn't know what she was going to do. Now, it turns out that she was an obstetrician. So she understood all about the screen. She knew what, a, a quad, uh, she knew what um, the soft marker meant. She knew what amniocentesis was. She knew what the risks were. But in the end, she decided not to proceed with any further tests because they didn't align with her values. So I think when we talk about informed decision making in the realm of prenatal genetic testing, it's so important to recognize how these two components come together to help patients navigate their options, those that we have now and those that we'll have in the future. So now that I've talked about informed consent and decision making in an overview, I want to drill down a little bit on a new technology and see, for instance, how patients are responding to this. How's the clinical environment responding to a new test out there? 
This is the first trimester screen, and it's a new way for, to perform aneuploidy screening. Screening is a test that you can do it on, on a mother to see if the fetus is at risk for a condition, specifically Down syndrome. Before this test, screening was done primarily in the second trimester of pregnancy, as you see up there. It, the advantage is that it did give information about the risk of, of Down syndrome, and so it can inform choices about doing other testing. The disadvantage, as Dr. Liley pointed out earlier, is decision making in that second trimester comes up with a lot of very difficult choices about termination or continuing the pregnancy, also about timing of when, when getting that information back on a diagnostic level test. So this new test is done in the first trimester, and it gives patients information much earlier. It's done in a, in a similar fashion with a blood test, but also a specialized ultrasound called a nuchal translucency, and gives information about the risk of Down syndrome, but can be used in conjunction with second trimester screen tests to even give you a better idea of that. So very powerful, important new technology. As a physician, I was very curious when this came to the forefront, knowing already some of the challenges our patients have in terms of deciding between their choices, getting the information that they need. What would be different about this new test? And what it means is that you're changing the decision making to the first trimester of pregnancy, as opposed to the quad check, which is the second. So let me tell you a little bit about what that means. The first trimester is a very different time in pregnancy. A lot of times we think about pregnancy as this. <laughs> but we also have to think about these. For some patients, we recognize that half of all pregnancies continue to be unplanned in this country. So if you don't find out you're pregnant until about, say, six weeks along, it's a very different time in the pregnancy. She may also be throwing up. She might have had a miscarriage in the past. She might be miscarrying now. So this is the context. This is the environment in which this new test is coming to the forefront, which, as a physician, knowing how patients feel so miserable sometimes or so um, uncertain for so many reasons, trying to explain this new test in a very short period of time. But it's more than that. It's about the complexity of the decision. So just to give you an overview, with the old way, the conventional way of screening, you had some lim limited choices afterwards. If you did the quad check, if it came back positive, you could do amniocentesis, you could do nothing, you could do um, an ultrasound to look for further signs. But now with the first trimester screen, beginning screening in the first trimester really changes that. So you can see how the decision that can start in the first trimester can lead downstream to a series of many other decisions, both in the first trimester and in the second trimester. So the decision is far more complex. So as a researcher, recognizing that we already have experienced barriers to inform decision making for the conventional form of screening, the then picture of screening, and now we have the now picture of screening, I want to ask how are patients going to make choices about reproductive risk in the context of their pregnancies? How can we help them navigate something like this? So I set out uh, to do research using the first trimester screen as a case. A new technology coming in, how are patients going to respond to that? And I took my research from two angles. First was pregnant women, asking them, what do you know about this test? What do you want to know about this test? And what I found was interesting that instead of sitting at a desk with a bunch of experts and saying, all right, let's come up with a survey and ask patients what do they know, we went to patients and did focus groups and asked them, what do you want to know and when do you want to know it? And we took that data and made a survey instrument and got more information from the patients, both at the time of screening and later in the pregnancy. But we also talked with physicians because we want to get a sense of what's going on in the clinic. What are doctors doing? We've already heard about some of the challenges of getting information to patients. So we asked, what are you doing to prepare your patients for this new test? And what resources do you have? Do you have a pamphlet? Do you have a video? Do you have something that you could help your patients navigate these choices? And we had some very interesting results, and I'll share some of them with you today. We found issues with core aspects of decision making. So challenges to understanding foundational concepts of Down syndrome. Do you recall a couple slides back, I said it's important for patients to understand what the condition is for which they're testing for? We found this was a real problem, that patients didn't understand really what Down syndrome was. We also found that there are challenges to understanding the foundational concepts of testing, the idea of a, a screen versus a diagnostic test, but particularly interpretation of results. <laughs> What's an abnormal result? What's a high-risk result? Wait, what does that mean? I don't know. But also concepts of risk, something which has been a recurrent problem. How do you explain risk to patients? Which category would you rather be in if you're in a lottery? You've got to be one out of 40 you'll win a ticket or one out of 500? Which odds sound better? 
may sound like a simple question, but it's a really hard concept when you think about it. Which group do you want to be in? And those are some of the issues that our patients are struggling with as well. Um, as it was mentioned that their practice uh, recommendations which have changed aneuploidy screening, now all patients regardless of age are um, offered aneuploidy screening. But we found that not all of our patients were aware of this. In fact, less than half were aware of the screens. And this is where that uninformed decline can come into play. We had a patient who, who captured it perfectly. I thought this was just for older women. And this is a 25-year-old woman. So she just thought this test was not for her. She wasn't going to talk to her doctor about it because it's for the 40-year-old woman, not her. And so she declined it, when in fact it could have had some value to her. Also, we found that there was a difference in knowledge about um, CVS versus amniocentesis. The first, trimester the first trimester screen opens up the door for CVS right off the bat. <coughs> many of our patients didn't know what CVS was, nor what the risks were. So we have many educational uh, benchmarks we have to meet for this new test. It's not just about knowledge, those knowledge components, it's about getting the right information. We're understanding the importance of patient-centered counseling these days, finding out what patients want to know and telling them so they can make that choice for themselves. And so we asked patients, what do you want to know? And this is what they told us. They want their doctor to be upfront and not assume anything. And here's, a, I think, a great, great quote. I just want to make sure when you choose a test, you are aware of what's going to happen. And then if you choose this test, if it's positive, are you going to consider to keep the baby or are you going to give up? So I think parents should be aware about what's going to happen after this test. I think that has to be informed. So it leads the question, are physicians talking about this with their patients? This very difficult notion of possible pregnancy termination, and they're doing that in the first OB visit when they start to have to talk about this new test. This is going to be a busy slide, but I want to give you the overview. And what we found out when we looked at many decision-making factors is that many of the, the physicians and the pa patients were talking over each other. What we found is, let's see if I can use a laser pointer here. Here's the patient, here's the physician. These are things that patients found more important. This is what physicians thought patients would find them to be important. So what we did is we asked patients, what do you think is important? Then we asked docs, tell us what you emphasize in your counseling process. And there's a great mismatch. So the idea is patients wanted their doc to say, if you're going to take this test, you're going to choose either to continue the pregnancy or terminate, but the docs weren't responding in that way. They were talking more about the standard rhetoric of risks, benefits, alternatives. So we need to get the right information to patients. It's also getting the right information, but getting it at the right time. And this is one of these intriguing aspects of first trimester screening again. So let me ask you, when you've been to your doctor, do you get all your questions answered? Even as a doctor, I don't get all my questions answered. And so I think that the first trimester, that first visit, the first prenatal visit, given the timing of when the test is offered, given the timing of prenatal care, and when women present for their testing, that's when it's got to happen. You got one shot to do it. One of our participants said, my obstetrician doesn't even want to see us until we're eight weeks pregnant. So that doesn't leave a whole lot of time in your first trimester. And I think this next quote is fabulous. That initial prenatal appointment is overwhelming. There's a lot of information presented to you and you don't necessarily remember everything and you're excited and you forget what questions you have to ask. And finally, it was just one of those early meetings where you go in and suddenly he was kind of giving me the gamut of possibilities. So this is the context in which women have to learn about this new and very important test and make decisions about it. And one more aspect of the first trimester. Do you remember the faces I showed you a few minutes ago? Let me give you some passages from some of our participants. This one, this pregnancy, was a shocker to me. I had a lot of mixed emotions. When I found out I was pregnant, I went through every emotion in the spectrum. My husband and I tried getting pregnant for five years, and we went through all different treatments and everything. So when it finally happened, it was a shock. It was a disbelief. I didn't even believe it for four months. It just didn't set in. <clears throat> and finally, I definitely had some more trepidation because I did have a miscarriage, so I was very nervous those beginning weeks. Those are the beginning weeks in which women need to make this choice if they're going to use this test. And it makes it very hard to get the information, hear the information, process the information in a timely fashion. The first trimester screen is an important new tool. It can give our patients information that they need to guide their choices. 
And with all new technologies, as we're mentioning, as the speakers have already mentioned and will continue to talk about, these are important tools, but we need to help our patients make informed decisions about them. Our choices are increasing. The choice used to be more or less never simple, but fewer choices, and now they're expanding, and sometimes they're expanding in language you don't even understand. And as physicians, we have to help our patients navigate those choices, decide which path they want to go down if they even want to go down one of those paths. So in the context of the advances in genetic technology, I just want to give just a few more words about what makes decision making in the context of pregnancy so complicated. And one thing I call it prediction and plasticity. The idea that a genetic test is not a crystal ball. It gives you information, but it can't give you everything. And even in the world of obstetrics, when we can diagnose things in utero, even better than before, we have amazing ways to image now. This is a, fetal, this is a maternal MRI still won't tell us everything about what happens in the delivery room or beyond. Also, the notion that uh, neonates have a plasticity. We don't, they can heal, they can adapt, they can change. We don't know how a neonate, how a child can adapt to the things that happen in utero. So there's so much unknown. Finally, the therapies and options that are here now or maybe in the future. One of my patients who found out that her fetus had a, a, a very bad uh, blood disease, a thalassemia, was thinking about terminating the pregnancy, but changed her mind because she said, well, I know what I'm going to need to do now if I raise her, but what about in five years? There may be a therapy. Things are happening so fast. What about in 10 years? It may be a very different picture. So these are the things that make our decisions so much more complicated, and I'm glad we're here today to try and work these out. So I'd like to close with one of my favorite quotes from one of my study participants, who I'm so thankful for the work that they allowed us to do. What would I really do? You wouldn't want to spend nine months worrying. Then on the other hand, you might want to know because you might want to be prepared. So the decision for screening would be hard. That would be really hard. And I'm glad I'm here and I'm thinking about all this because it really poses a lot of questions. What would I really do? Thank you. Oh, you know what? Yes. Elizabeth. Okay. Um, Elizabeth has a burning question to ask. Burning before we, before we uh, get started with the uh, panelists. So Ruth says, go ahead. So the informed consent discussion sounds great, except you talked about the condition. What are you going to say with whole genome sequencing? I'm just going to finish. Oh, genome sequencing. Sorry. I don't want to finish. She discussed informed consent, of course. And she talked about the condition, telling people about the condition and having them repeat it back. Now we're talking about whole genome sequencing. What do you say? And what do they say back? So if I get to repeat it, I can ask the question in a way I can answer it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was talking about conditions, so spending time talking about what the condition is that you're testing for, how are we going to do that with the idea of whole genome sequencing coming on board? Is that a reasonable mm -hmm. way to? Um, I don't have an answer for that. That's, I hope to in the future. One of the things is that we just don't know what all this data means. Incidental findings, um, interpretation of results, there's so many unknowns, which makes me wonder if we should even make this available if we can't explain to our patients what we're doing. We're not just on a fishing expedition, but it needs to align with the patient's goals of what they want. Mm I'd like for our panelists to come down and um, get a little bit closer and let me introduce you. Dina, Georgia, you must be Elliot. You, you can stay there if you want until, you, until it's time. And um, where's Barbara? I'm here. Barbara, okay. Um, we have four panelists today um, in this uh, section. Professor Dina Davis, 
is actually a close colleague of ours until just last year. Um, so now she is the endowed presidential chair in health humanities and social sciences at Lehigh University. And Georgia Wiesner, my colleague and friend also, like Dina. Um, Georgia is in the Department of Genetics and Medicine um, and actually you will be leaving soon, which is going to be a loss to, to all of us here. Um, Elliot, Elliot Philipson, you're the uh, chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Hillcrest um, Hospital here in the Cleveland area and they are affiliated, of course, with Cleveland Clinic, and you're also a professor of surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. So, Barbara. Barbara, uh, Dr. Biesecker is an associate investigator with the social um, and behavioral research branch at NIHGR, at NIH. You're, you're also the director of John Hopkins um, uh, and NHGRI's uh, training program in genetic counseling. So thank you very much. Yeah. Hi. You were tired of looking at slides, right? Good. Um, so, right. I'm Dina Davis, and my talk is entitled Opportunistic Testing, <coughs> excuse me, as a threat to autonomy and informed consent. And I, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me, thanking John Katz and Jessica Mazursky for help in thinking through these issues, and thanking Elizabeth Thompson and her husband-to-be, Jim Hansen, for back when I first met you, um, <laughs> for, for um, allowing Right, I remember when Jim proposed. Um, so seriously, for allowing me to hang out with them at the University of Iowa Hospital um, a long time ago, and I've never met a genetic counselor I didn't like, and I think it's because the first one I met was Elizabeth. So um, my talk places prenatal diagnosis in a larger context, so please bear with me well, I back up a bit and take a running leap, and I, I promise to get there in my allotted minutes. I began thinking about this topic a few years ago in the Shaker Heights kitchen of friends I'll call Jack and Kate. We were putting the finishing touches on dinner when Jack told me that he just found out the results of a PSA test for prostate cancer, and it was high. Hmm, I said, what made you decide to take that test? He looked at me blankly. He hadn't decided, hadn't been given the choice. He hadn't even realized his doctor had ordered the test until he was given the results. Um, and believe me, that's extremely common. Um, so I was very fond of my friend who was quite upset by all this, and I went a little bit ballistic. So um, I got on the web and I reminded myself and Jack and Kate of what I already knew. All the reputable websites essentially <laughs> echoed the statement from the American Cancer Society recommending, quote, that men have a chance to make an informed decision with their health care provider about whether to be screened for prostate cancer. The decision should be made after getting information about the uncertainties risks and potential <coughs> benefits of prostate cancer screening. Men should not be screened unless they receive this information, close quote. So why was my friend given such a controversial test without his informed consent? Because the test is opportunistic. My friend was used to having his blood screened for each routine visit for, you know, lipids or whatever, and the physician could piggyback the PSA test on top of the other tests without getting extra blood or doing anything else that he would have to explain or get permission for. And while I don't condone that practice, anything but, it's easy to imagine the physician's thought process or perhaps the institution's thought process. To not offer PSA might lead to a lawsuit down the road. To offer it with an appropriate discussion 
would take a bit of time, maybe 15, 20 minutes. The average office visit, according to one study, um, is 19 minutes. So better just to give the test to everyone and save precious time to discuss it only when the results are problematic, which might be maybe 5% of the men, dep depending. So the bioethics movement, as we've already said and will keep saying, I hope, happily over the next 24 hours, was born as a full-throated defense of patient empowerment. And the challenges to overcome um, at the beginning were lack of information and a paternalistic medical profession. Although the theoretical pendulum has swung a bit, no one has ever questioned the basic commitment to informed consent. The threat comes now, I believe, from opportunistic testing combined with pressures of time and money and extruded through the trend toward routinization that seems pervasive in medicine and that Nancy Press and Barbara Katz Rothman have written about. I truly fear that this threat has seriously eroded any semblance of informed consent in some of the most basic and common medical decision making we do. And the three instances I'm thinking about are the PSA screening I already discussed, newborn screening, and maternal blood tests for fetal anomalies. So in newborn screening, we began with PKU, a disease that responded to treatment and needed to be found quickly. As time went on, the number of tests increased exponentially and began to include conditions that were not responsive to treatment or were collected for research purposes only. And that's why I use the term opportunistic. You start out with a well-established screen that the subject expects or is conditioned to or has, that has some sort of rationale, and then you piggyback onto that more and more tests on the same sample. Of course, more tests should equal more need for consent, especially when the purpose shifts from clinical to research, but in fact, all the pressures push in the other direction. So finally, we come to prenatal diagnosis. And we've heard already about non-invasive testing for trisomies via maternal blood. As we all know, the current standard practice for screening and testing pregnant women is a mix of non-invasive and invasive screening and tests. And an array of screening tools provides each person with an individual risk assessment, but it's not diagnostic and will not detect all chromosomal abnormalities. Invasive testing, such as CVS or amnio, is extremely accurate, but it carries that small but significant risk of miscarriage that we just heard about. So a non-invasive, highly accurate test is kind of a, a holy grail of prenatal diagnosis. And as you've heard, we now um, have that um, released by the company Sequinome and some others, a test that, as I understand it, detects 99% of trisomies via fetal DNA in maternal blood beginning around the 10th week of pregnancy. The company said the test is aimed at the 750,000 pregnancies at high risk for Down syndrome annually in the U.S., but as the cost comes down, and it inevitably will, there's no reason to reserve it only for pregnancy at high risk for Down since the test itself is risk-free. There are, of course, as we've heard, enormous emotional and ethical issues attached to prenatal diagnosis. When the gold standard for detection is an invasive test, then informed consent is a sine qua non. Not only, as somebody pointed out, is the risk of miscarriage kind of a, oh, let's stop and think about this point, or a kind of gatekeeper. Um, but it makes consent crucial because each woman will evaluate and balance the risks in an individual way. Um, and also, to state the obvious, it would be unthinkable to perform a CVS or amnio without consent because first, it's invasive, and secondly, it's a standalone procedure that cannot be piggybacked, obviously, onto something else. If you're having an amnio, you know you're having an amnio, <laughs> or at least something very different and very specific is happening to you. Thus, 
CVS and Amnio are the focus of thoughtful, often anguished decision making. Weighing the risks of having a baby with Down versus the risks of losing a healthy fetus forces couples to think about Down syndrome and what a child with Down would mean for their family. Well, I'm not extolling anguish for its own sake. There's enough anguish in the world already. And personally, I think a decisive test for trisomy that's non-invasive early and risk-free is, is a wonderful thing. Um, and I think it's great that women will be able to focus on the question of testing for trisomy detached from issues of possible miscarriage. But I worry that this will become another opportunistic test that will often be performed without informed consent. We already know from the work of Nancy Press and others that screening without adequate information is common, and I fear that screening without informed consent will become testing without informed consent in a fairly seamless way, joining the other areas of medicine where informed consent is receding into the distance. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Wiesner, Georgia Wiesner. I want to thank the organizers for having me come speak today. Um, many of us have worked together um, in our many projects trying to link our understanding of genetics and ethics, and I think this is one of the outgrowths of that thought, really focused on prenatal. Um, issues. As many of you know, um, I am not a prenatal geneticist. And uh, when I was talking to people about coming and speaking here, they said, why are you doing that? <laughs> My background is in cancer genetics. But I think there's many things that um, overlay in terms of our understanding of genetics, how we approach that. And my comments today are really going to focus on what does the physician need to know and physician education as we try to explain these new tests, go through the process of informed consent. Because if a physician or healthcare giver does not understand the tests, they cannot possibly get informed consent or obtain informed consent. I've also been really struck by some of the comments that we've had, that I've been listening to from comparing old and new. And I'm kind of one of those old and new people, so I've lived through some of the, the older, older ways of thinking about things. But what is, what is central and what continues? Um, uh, the struggles between knowing and not knowing. How do you use that information? That has not changed with the new genetic technology. Um, I'm really struck by the similarities on our moral computations and the perspectives of people between the old and new um, technologies. I don't think they've changed from a patient's point of view. I think the patient's point of view is still the same. And I think the physician's point of view is also very much the same. Um, what is a little troubling to me now is that lots of our conversation today have had to do with a single test and we're focusing on the newer tests that can look at aneuploidies and we've talked a lot about a test and that's not where genetics is going. Genetics is going into multiple tests, uh, different types of tests, combination tests, whole genome sequencing. And so um, we need to learn and apply what we know about a single test to these uh, larger panels. And obviously it's gonna be more difficult because um, think about how long it's taken us to really try to get a handle on um, the sensitivity, specificity for Down syndrome testing. That's taken a lot of time, and now we're going to apply that on a whole genome basis. So that's um, uh, challenges for us to think about. So when we think about applications of testing for the medical professional, what do they really need to know? And I'm, my comments are really from a lot of the work that I've been doing in teaching medical students. Um, and just remember, medical students, as they mature into doctors, are very smart people from the community. So they have their own cultural biases, their own information, they have their own values, and therefore there's not one point of view that people have when they come into medicine, and they don't um, coalesce into one point of view throughout uh, being a physician or a healthcare provider. 
So the cultural diversity that we meet um, on our patients' basis is always there uh, within the number of physicians that um, meet with patients. So we also have to focus our training on that, on that cultural uh, diversity. We've also pointed out that physicians don't have time. Many studies have been talking about how much time does a physician have. I was working with a group here in family medicine that actually clocked every moment of the event uh, within a clinical um, activity um, in a family practices offices and a new patient took 10 minutes. If they asked a family history, it took 12. They were really pushed to go through. Now, how are we going to do that within the context of no time when we're taking care of patients? It's a very, very big problem. But there are some things that I think physicians really do need to know as they deal with genetic information. And I've thought of five of them, and I'm sure they're much more than that. But see, there's, these are just basic concepts. The first is that I think physicians forget is that a genetic evaluation does not take place in a vacuum. It takes place within the context of that individual and that individual's environment. So if we think about a woman and the growing fetus, that wonderful dyad, we add in dad. That's another triad. We add in the sibs in the house. We add in maternal grandmother. We add in the paternal grandmother. We add in the whole family. So that just now changes the whole dynamic of how a person might go through the testing. Where is that individual, that mother that's trying to think about these tests, how does she fit that in? So one thing the physicians do not do well is that they see a patient in front of them, they do a test on that patient, and they are absolutely forgetful of the context and the family-based context. Every genetic test will have implications for family, and we always have to remember that, and physicians often forget that. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that a variant or a change in a genetic code is not always equal, or they are not always equal. So one variant might be neutral, might not have any effect at all clinically. There may be another variant right next door that is going to have a great deal of clinical significance. So how you explain variants and how you understand what we call the issue of penetrance, how strong is a specific allele, how, how is that going to be incorporated in your care. So not all variations are equal. And I think Dr. Driscoll made great points of that in looking at the CNVs of these patients as they were, as they were going forward. Um, our patients like to think in I have a disease, I have a, a gene, and therefore they're all one together, and that's explanatory. So this one gene, one mutation, um, one disease model uh, just doesn't work. It's not correct biologically, but in our minds, that's, uh, that's the model that we all have. Um, my third point is that uh, as much as we'd like to get away from it, and um, Elizabeth mentioned this, genetics is primarily statistical. We will always be statistical because the information comes back in statistics. So as we move towards genome analysis, we will have many variations, and all of those variations will have different statistics and different risks for disease. So we cannot get away from that statistical um, uh, presentation of data, and therefore we must move away from a yes or no answer. And that's part of the problem with thinking about a single test. Does it say yes? Does it say no? Unfortunately, it might say maybe. And how are we going to deal with that maybe when we have many, 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 many tests as we go forward? Um, the utility of tests is also important. What clinically is important about that test and how is it going to be used? Sometimes people use the terms now clinically actionable which to me means, okay, I have something here and I need to do something. I need to have action for that patient. But there are many different variants that don't fall in that clinically actionable set. How are you gonna explain that to people? My fourth point that physicians need to know and explain to their patients is what is the difference between a screening test and a diagnostic test? And we're actually confusing those terms a lot through our conversations today, and I think we all know what we mean when we say test. 
It's the application that's very important. Patients don't understand this. This is not going to make a difference to them. So we need to be very clear on how those tests are going to be used. And then all of these things together boil down to my fifth point, which is this clinical utility idea again. How are we going to develop clinical utility of a genome-wide test performed in, uh, in pregnancy for that fetus as we provide the information to uh, the parents of that particular child-to-be? This is one of our huge problems, and I really can't wait to hear how you're going to answer that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Georgia. Um, okay. Do you mind helping me? Oh, Ellie, I'm not, can you? Sorry. That's okay. Um, who wants to go next? <laughs> yeah. Ellie, I don't know. Thanks, Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't uh, have anything prepared, but I have a lot, to, a few things I'd like to just say because. Um, this is really a great audience and a great discussion so far, and I'm really delighted uh, for the committee to have invited me, and in particular Ruth, uh, to have invited me to this. Um, I helped Ruth do some of these studies in the, in the first trimester uh, program, and um, one of the things I've learned from Ruth and others is that no matter how much genetic counseling you do, um, it's never enough. And it always, always comes back to you mean it's me, it's I'm the one with the abnormal screen. And so um, I, I want to thank Ruth for um, getting involved in, in our patients and getting involved in this very important uh, area of informed consent. Um, I also wrote a paper 20 years ago about informed consent. No one ever quotes the paper or cites the paper. Um, but what it showed is, is that when we do research, um, we're at a much higher grade level of our informed consent than the average literacy level in, in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, I know there's programs you can go into Word and you can hit the button and it'll tell you what le literacy level is. But unless you're really reading it and paying attention to it, um, I think we do a disservice for some of our research projects in, in terms of informed consent. Um, I want to, I am a, a maternal fetal medicine person. I do a little bit of what Dr. Driscoll does. Um, maybe a little more, a little bit less, I don't, I don't know, but I want to thank Elizabeth for making the comment about uh, how maternal fetal medicine treat pregnant women better. Um, I wish that was always true. Well, that's my take on what you said, uh, <clears throat> but it's not always true, unfortunately. Just because you have credentials as a maternal fetal medicine doesn't necessarily mean that we do things better, although we might have a little more training and a little more uh, expertise in particular areas. I'm not sure that we deal with things better, wh however you define better. Um, listening to the presentations there, I'm kind of struck by two things that, that um, sort of didn't come up. Uh, Dina talked a little bit about the Internet, and, and we're talking about expanding technology. And I don't know whether the Internet is helpful or not helpful. Um, there's not a person that doesn't come in to see me that hasn't Googled me uh, and find out how many lawsuits I've had, where I trained, what I did, and, and then after we get past that, um, they've looked up every term that you're going to use, uh, choroid plexus cysts, uh, echogenic foci, and I don't know what, what website they go to. So in, if they get on some of these uh, social networks and they start chatting or tweeting, um, you, they get a lot of comments from people who have had um, experiences, some of them good, some of them bad. So I never encourage people not to go on the Internet because I know they will no matter what I say. Um, I wonder what they're going to when they're doing it. And so um, I try to guide them to websites where I think some of the information is helpful or, or at least certainly unbiased. Uh, and I don't know whether you've had that experience or not, but it, it, it's, it can be very, very challenging. Um, the other area that I think is kind of interesting, I can't, first of all, I can't wait to get home and see how the toilet paper is in my, in my bathroom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but the other area that no one really has talked about is cost, although someone mentioned 
costs. I called uh, Sequinon yesterday, and I pretended to be a patient. And well, I didn't. My nurse pretended to be the patient because I knew they wouldn't talk to me necessarily. And I asked about, can you tell me what kind of performance criteria? Oh yeah, we have performance criteria. So what I got was for trisomy 21. I thought this would be relevant, and I hope you don't mind. Maybe most of you know this already. Um, but uh, for trisomy 21, the sensitivity was 99% that there were 210 of 212 cases that were detected. Um, I don't know whether you consider 212, 210 and 212 a big enough number to call it 99%. Um, I talked to Mark Evans the other day, who you probably know, and he wasn't so sure about that either. Uh, when, you, when you talk, when they talk about trisomy 18, it was 59 out of 59. So they gave a 99.9% uh, sensitivity. And when trisomy uh, 13 was 11 out of 12 uh, for uh, 91 or 92% sensitivity. Um, the other thing that I asked about was what it was going to cost. Um, and really, no one's talked really about cost. Uh, so they gave me very conveniently the CPT code, which was 8499 and the test description. And depending on what kind of insurance you had, the cost ranged from $235 to $475, but the insurance companies were billed $2,762. And when I asked, did the insurance companies pay that, um, they hemmed and they hawed, and uh, they, liked, they wanted to tell me that they did, but they couldn't really come out and say that they did. So I suspect that they don't. Interestingly, um, if you're a military patient, did you ask about specificity since you were asking about performance category? Um, they hummed and hawed on that, so I couldn't get any direct information. Did you say the $2,000 figure was the charges? That was the, that was what was billed to the insurance company. Okay. Yes. By the provider. By, by the insurance company. The insurance company billed two thousand seven hundred sixty-two dollars. Well. They charge. Right. The laboratory, Sequinon, will charge the patient, the insurance company, $2,762, in addition to whatever our, our charge might be. Okay. Yeah. The mil if you have military insurance, apparently the cost is free. And if you have Ohio Medicaid patient, the cost is also free. Um, for a self pay patient, and um, this is very interesting. Um, the out of, maximum out-of-pocket cost is $1,933. So for the group that may need this the most, um, it's $1,900, and probably they can't afford that most of the time. So I just thought that um, these two areas were kind of interesting. Um, I do a lot of prenatal diagnosis. I do a lot of genetic testing. I do about 150 CVSs a year. Um, that number will probably drop now, um, and maybe that's okay, but I don't think we figured out, as Dr. Driscoll has said, how we're going to use this test, and uh, we're kind of in the middle of America here in Cleveland. The East Coast and the West Coast are usually ahead of us, so what happens on the East and the West usually comes to the middle, and we, we, we quite haven't figured it out yet, but I'm, I'm sure we will. So um, I'm more than willing to take questions. We can do it as a panel or... Or, or afterwards is fine. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Barbara, come on down. I, I was a little enthusiastic there, I think. And we're glad you are. Can you help me find my slides? They're on the desktop, but I don't know how to get out of it. I'm not a PC user. It did, uh, okay. Escape. Okay. Here's a folder. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think I got it. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. I got carried away. I apologize. <laughs> I got carried away because I was sitting here thinking after all these um, lovely provocative 
talks about the span of my entire career. I guess it's part of a midlife crisis or something. Um, and I think uh, the, the crisis is what a lot of people have mentioned. The fact that we're talking about the same issues we were talking about at the beginning of my career and they haven't gone away. And the new issues that are coming on top of those old issues that haven't gone away that challenge us to think about things. And I'm going to talk about um, some research. But before I do, I want to just remind all of us. So I am old. I do teach. But I listen to audio tapes of cases, about six to eight different cases a week um, from 37 different clinics in our area because I train genetic counseling students, and they're required to tape all their cases. So even though I'm old, I still do hear current cases from a variety of different settings done by a variety of different people. So um, I think I'm up to date as well as being old. And I think one of the biggest traps we continue to fall in, we have always fallen into, is that we want people to get the information. And clearly, we don't want people to make naive decisions. Ruth very nicely outlined the pitfalls of that. Um, but I think we need to think very, very seriously about what we're asking of people. Ruth also outlined in informed decision making the importance for understanding about the condition and the test and how it's interpreted. And we need to take into account what adult education specialists know, what our capacity is to take in information. As adults who are experiential learners, we have to take in information because it's relevant to us and we can make meaning out of it. So if we have no biology background and it has no pertinence to us at the time and we don't really care about the information, we're not educating anybody. So I think we need to think about essential bits of information that we think people need to understand. There are also three or four decades worth of information in heuristics done by social psychologists. Huge books written about something called risk perception. Risk perception predicts behavior, not risk knowledge. And it's because risk perception is not just cognitive, it's affective. It's about our lived experience. It's about what we hope for. It's about what we fear. Risk perception is what drives decisions. And people can have very, very distorted risk perceptions. And it doesn't matter how many times we teach them genetics. So we have to get out of the old trap that we just need to teach them the information and they just need to get an accurate risk perception because it's not going to happen. And people who came before us knew that long before we got here. So I want us to move forward and get beyond that. Um, I am one of the biggest advocates of genetic counseling on the planet. I picked an incredible profession. I love to train students. It is very hard to do. Um, it is often done very poorly. And I think we need to work really hard to figure out the best ways to do it because it's humbling and it's complicated and every person who walks into your office is different than the one who came before. And yet there's existing literature that can help inform the way we do it. So I am a huge proponent of no longer teaching genetic counselors by apprenticeship, which is how I was trained and how many, many of us were trained because it's a new field. And it needs to be increasingly evidence-based. We need to pay attention to the literature that we can understand. So I'm going to share, um, and I was very humbled um, early in my career when I was asked to be on a um, a very important panel in Washington, D.C. to represent genetic counseling it was a really scary thing to do. And every panel member wanted to know evidence for every single thing that I uttered out of my mouth, and I didn't have evidence for any of it. And I swore on it after that experience I would never let that happen again. So I'm going to talk about something that my dear friend and colleague, Barb Bernhardt, would say is good old common sense. Because even though evidence is important, it's often good when it's based on good old common sense and common experience. So I'm going to talk about ambivalence. So this is not going to cause you to go, aha. It's just going to reassure you that things you can have some common sense about might have some um, evidence behind them. So I'm arguing what many people have talked about. I'm going to talk about invasive prenatal testing here, the old-fashioned test. Um, the aim of offering testing options to pregnant women, obviously, is to help them make informed choices. There's lots of different um, definitions of informed consent, of de informed decision making, of informed choices. The good news is Ruth and I did not um, talk about this ahead of time, but my definition, which comes from the health psychology literature, parallels her, 
her definition, but we want to help people make personal decisions of high quality. And we have to be very honest about the things Eric Jungst raised. If we're really trying to help people make the decisions that we want them to make, that's not um, what we say we're trying to do, and we need to really figure that out. So I'm going to advocate that we're helping people make informed choices that minimize their um, decisional regret, and, we, and I use these terms because we have ways of measuring them, and maximize their satisfaction with the decision that they make. And there, there is a, a de definition of genetic counseling that includes the goal of facilitating informed choice, because I helped write it. I wanted to make sure it was in there, um, because I think we need to study what evidence exists about how to do that. I worked with Teresa Marteau. She and her colleague, um, Susan Mickey, developed a model for defining informed choice. Um, I know this is different than how bioethicists or philosophers or lawyers define these things, but we need to know how to measure them. And so we try to reduce them down to some basics so that we can talk about um, what we're seeing. And they've defined informed choice as one with having sufficient understanding, and we could be here for a week arguing what sufficient understanding means, of relevant information um, that is consistent with one's attitudes towards the object of the decision. And that just means your attitudes toward undergoing prenatal testing. The important thing in the connection to Ruth's talk is that those attitudes are formed by your underlying values and beliefs. So we're talking about values and beliefs, but we measure them as attitudes. So attitudes are are exactly what they sound like, thoughts or feelings. They're both a favorableness or unfavorableness toward a behavior. And we have scales that can measure these that usually include five to seven different items. And they have been used in many, many health behavior studies and have sh been shown to be a very strong predictor of many health decisions. And I know you won't like this, but attitudes almost always trump knowledge. Attitudes, values, and decisions are what drive decisions more often than knowledge. That still doesn't mean we want people to make naive decisions, but we have to think about where we get the most um, action, and it's around attitudes. There have been a lot of studies related to prenatal testing on existing attitudes toward, uh, again, issues that Ruth raised, attitudes towards raising a child with Down syndrome, attitudes toward abortion. Um, but I was looking at attitudes towards undergoing the prenatal test. Um, many people, again, in health behavior have um, brokered in ambivalence recently because this is something that we can actually affect. And ambivalence has been defined as having simultaneous positive and negative feelings toward an object, in this case, prenatal testing. Um, and it's actually a measure of attitude strength. And it's not very hard to think this through. You didn't grow up developing attitudes about prenatal testing. Well, maybe you did. Your dad was a prenatal <laughs> physician. But most of us did not, right? But we did grow up learning about what does it mean to be different? What does it mean to be a parent? What does it mean to have a family? What does it mean to be a responsible person? What does it mean to take care of myself? What does it mean to be an autonomous being? What does it mean to be an informed person? So many values and beliefs form those attitudes, right? So the attitudes toward undergoing prenatal testing can be strong or weak depending on how fervently you believe the values and beliefs that contribute them to them. And I'm not going to talk about it today, but one of our graduate students did a brilliant um, qualitative study in a, a population of prenatal women, almost all of whom went forward with invasive prenatal testing. And we interviewed them, uh, we measured and interviewed them about their attitudes and ambivalence. And their positive attitudes toward testing were off the chart. All of them were very positive. And there, uh, there was ambivalence prevalent in every single one of those women's decisions. So it was trumped by their positive attitudes, but there was still underlying ambivalence. And it's not very surprising what it's about, but it's about am I making the right choice? Am I being a good parent? Am I putting a pregnancy at risk unnecessarily? They're, they're fairly um, one, things that you can predict. So um, what that tells you is what I'm going to share with you quantitatively probably minimizes a bigger problem than I've actually measured. So um, in many studies, ambivalence has been shown to moderate the relationship between attitudes and intentions or behaviors. And I've already told you, attitudes are a strong predictor of intentions or behavior. And for anybody who likes theory, I won't bore you. This is a theory of planned behavior. It's been used for a couple decades, and it has stood the test of time in many different studies. And I'm talking about the role that ambivalence plays. 
So ambivalence is going to moderate the strength of the attitudes in predicting the decision, then that has a practical outcome. So stronger attitudes are a better predictor of intentions and subsequent behavior. They're more likely to persist because they're based on those tightly held values and beliefs that people have and to be more resistant to persuasion. But ambivalence can re reflect more weakly held attitudes or in the case of prenatal testing, very conflicting ideas that um, women often have. And many studies have now been done to suggest ambivalence impedes making an informed choice. And I'll come back and draw that, that circle around. If I don't, you can shoot me. Um, so my research question was, does ambivalence uh, undermine the consistency between attitudes and behavior making decisions about prenatal testing? And my hypothesis based on other studies um, was that it would lead to less informed choices. Um, we worked in five different settings. Um, prenatal genetic counseling settings where people completed a baseline survey, underwent genetic counseling, then did a follow-up survey, um, and then four to six weeks later we found out what choice they made. Um, and uh, genetic counseling colleagues all across the country helped me with this study and I will acknowledge them at the end, but I couldn't have done it without them. There was no difference in the key variables between survey one and survey two, so genetic counseling didn't change things somewhat, but not to a statistically significant degree, so I'm only presenting data from survey two after genetic counseling. I gotta finish up. Yeah, okay, it's only a couple more slides. So we had 210 women who um, participated in this study and they, um, they paralleled the socio-demographics of people who go for prenatal testing. Um, and we were able to show, as we hypothesized, there was a very high correlation between attitudes and the decision that people made. But when they had uh, um, high ambivalence, they were um, much, the relationship between attitudes and prenatal testing was compromised and that was a statistically significant difference. Unfortunately, we only had outcome data on 84 women, I'll tell you about that later, um, to find out what decision that they ultimately made. But if you look at the people who made informed choices to undergo prenatal testing, those that had high level of, there were much um, fewer who had high levels of ambivalence and many more who had low levels of ambivalence, um, supporting our hypothesis. So our, our findings highlight an important role for ambivalence as an impediment to informed choice and prenatal genetic counseling can act to mitigate that ambivalence. I think some amount of ambivalence is good if you're putting a pregnancy at potential risk, but you can help people reconcile those competing values. Um, so I'm an advocate of intervention studies that look at ambivalence and if we have to minimize resources targeting women who are more likely to be ambivalent and that's something that we can screen for in the clinic. There are limitations to this study as there are in all studies, um, but it was an actual sample in pe where people were really um, making actual decisions and it parallels a study that was done in the UK on prenatal screening. So thank you very much. Barbara, don't go anywhere. Come on back. Um, thank you very much, Barbara. What, um, what we're going to do now is have a conversation um, and I'd like the panelists to come and join us up front here and Ruth, you're right there. Uh, you can come down too if you want. Anyone who has questions um, for Ruth or any of our panelists should uh, come down to the microphones. You know, I couldn't tell when this microphone, I thought that this was on. It's not on? It's, it's on? Okay. And we have a solid 15 minutes for um, oh, no. questions. So embarrassing. I'm going to hear about that forever. <laughs> yes. I know, there you are. You could get I thought he was going to raise it for me, but anyway, I'm standing on a step. So, um, I guess the way I see what's happened in prenatal diagnosis is we have testing that has gotten more and more and more specialized. And normally, what happens is you have a, a PCP who then refers to the specialist, the specialist discusses things with the patient and then recommend specialized testing. And of course, the consent 
then is more informed because that person knows more about the test and knows more about the options. So I guess as our testing has gotten more and more complicated now that we're into massive parallel sequencing, you know, it's still, the informed consent is still in the hands of generalists. And I guess the question is, is, is how, how do we deal with that? Or, do you understand what I'm saying? No? Well, I think for, if I can yeah. respond, I think in yeah. some regards it is in the hands of the specialists. So, for instance, the first trimester screening that I was talking about, it's actually the maternal fetal medicine specialist who performs that ultrasound usually, or they have some advanced training. So it's, it's a process, you know, they, they learn something from the generalist, but then if they decide to do with that test, then they go to a specialist who explains that. So there are some structures still in place where the generalist at least gives them the idea, if this is something you want, and if you want that, then you go to the, the specialist. So that, that is still in place. Well, I guess um, the, the way I see it, though, is that it's actually been, the, the place where we really should counsel the patient is before <coughs> anything is done, whether, before they come for that first check, before they come for anything is actually when the counseling should take place, and that's when they aren't really seeing the specialists who understand the whole breadth of testing. Can, can I just make a comment? Because I, I think that, um, it's correct that people, um, when they have a time to actually consider the situation before they're there, before one is pregnant, for example, to consider what the options are is a, is a much better time. I, I, but if it is the primary care provider who is trying to um, uh, mention the topic and send somebody to uh, a specialist, that interaction has to be done within the time where a patient is busy, life is busy, and how are they going to take care of that, and the fact that many pregnancies are, are unplanned. So, so I think that, that it's, more, it's more of how do we fix the medical system for that. I think it's more of a, of a larger structural issue. And then secondly, I would say that the non-specialists, if they send a patient to a specialist, they are not thinking, I have to get, uh, I have to in inform the patient enough to get consent. I think they're saying, I'm sending that person to a specialist and that's the specialist's job. But if I could sort of ask a question, I've always been fascinated, you know, given, given the huge presence of, of medicine in our society, um, why the presence, why there's so little, well, put another way, when I look at Sesame Street, I think, boy, if we could hire those guys to explain probability, we'd be a long way exactly. down the road. I mean, exactly. there's, there's an awful lot of talent out there yeah, to explain exactly. stuff. So um, asking this as the absolute layperson, why couldn't the, you know, the first provider say to the patient, I'm sending you to the specialist, and in the two weeks before your appointment, here's a website I can direct you to that, you know, really has well, well vetted, well done, um, imaginative um, cartoons from the people who brought you Sesame Street that explains this stuff. I've never understood that, that gap. And, and I actually haven't either because often I see them, you know, once a test has been done and they say, well, I didn't even want this test. And now I have this result yeah. happens and, lot. you know, and then they're, it's dumped in my lap I'm as mad. the geneticist. But I think, <clears throat> to tell you the truth, in high school, what do we do? We push our kids to take calculus. Whoever uses calculus again, they should be taking probability and statistics. <laughs> I mean, you know, if we're going to talk about something that could actually help them. Yeah make decisions in their life. Hi, Jane, how are you? Hi. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, I can tell you what I did. I made a video. I made a 12-minute video, and I asked anybody who's referring patients to me to go online, watch my video. Um, it might not be as good as Sesame Street. Um, <laughs> but um, It's probably not. But, um, and I at least get some of the information to the patient before they come in to see me. And sometimes patients will cancel. They won't even come in and see me because they're either offended by something that I say on it or they don't realize that it's prenatal diagnosis, um, that I might be at, we might be testing for genetic things. 
and it's worked out very well. I think it's six years now it's up on the Internet. Um, I need to upgrade it because things have changed. But it's only 12 minutes long, and I ask them to, to refer. So that's one of the ways that I get around that. Thank you very much. Of course, we have to remember that some people don't have internet connections, don't speak English, and all those problems. But um, I just wanted to ask um, Barbara a question about um, genetic counseling. And I'm a new division director of maternal fetal medicine. I just hired a new genetic counselor. It turns out you're very expensive. And across the country, <laughs> for very good reasons. <laughs> across the country, though, how are your services being reimbursed? And is there more of a movement to get more healthcare dollars directed towards genetic counseling? I, and Barb's laughing because I'm, I'm the worst person in the room to answer that. Go for it, though. Yeah. Elizabeth, you're going to tackle that one? No. <laughs> I'm more. Um, I, I literally am not the right person to ask because I live in the Northwest Corridor in a somewhat unique circumstance where genetic counselors are paid well and um, work in a lot of institutions who are willing to pay their salaries without worrying about the clinical burden of them making costs. So I'm really not a good person to answer your question. They're well worth what they cost, though. Oh. I know, because I just hired one, and she's very expensive. I believe that. My question is, what are people doing where they don't see that? And it's going to be very difficult for them to justify the, the purchase of the genetic counselor. I don't think they're literally for sale. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, th I think that genetic counselors and the physicians they work with have to be very good at, and this is a burden that's on genetic counselors. We talk about this a lot in our training program. We have to be able to articulate what we are achieving with our clients and what the added benefit of that is. And we work really hard to develop a lot of language around making more informed choices and leading to less decisions that with poor outcomes and et cetera, et cetera. But it's, I don't think we're anywhere near being able to argue that we're cost effective. Barb knows more about that than I do. So can, can I jump in here? Um, I, I think cost is relative. Mm -hmm. So the task needs to be done. And it's complicated. And the patients really do need, particularly in a complicated situation, need to have that kind of support. So I think from a cost benefit and cost for the um, institution, if you'd say a physician would need to spend X amount of time or a physician working with a counselor and the counselor would have more time, that actually costs less. So that, that's, that's one thing. I think we have to wrap our heads around it because it is a little bit more cost effective. Secondly, there's a movement across the country for genetic counselors to obtain licensing. That's actually happening, and there's one of our representatives back there um, in the state of Ohio, but many states have, have achieved that. And the next challenge is, once licensing is there, what does that mean in terms of actually billing, and how do you bill, and how do hospitals credential? But all of those things are, are doable, but, but should, and, and should be done. Um, so I actually think, yes, the cost is there, but you have to measure it with the cost of, if you don't do something, what does that cost? If you do that all with physician time, it's a much greater cost. So, so in fact, I think it's a very, very good way to approach very complicated information with, with physicians, I mean, with, with um, healthcare providers that actually know how to communicate with patients. I'll just make one other comment. There are other health professionals you can draw on as well. Like? Like. Mm -hmm. nurses. nurses, yep. Who run prenatal right. clinics, mm -hmm. right. programs. Right, and they're and, expensive too. And they're <laughs> the same issues, but still, but still billing and, and et cetera. They right. They really have master's degrees and mm -hmm. so right. forth. That's a question. Yeah. Well, the first thing I, you have to do, if you want informed consent to be meaningful, is get rid of the doctors and the lawyers. I recently was asked to sign an 18-page document that was supposed to be an informed consent. I hope there was not a cognova note in the middle of it. You have to explain to the patient what the issues are, and unfortunately this takes time. It doesn't take a huge amount of time, and it doesn't take 18 pages. 
Tolstoy could do a good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's it for a pimple trial? It was for a nothing. <laughs> nothing. It was just a procedure, it was not a clinical trial? It was a clinical trial. Yeah. Uh, well, there, yeah. there you go. <laughs> So I have a couple, one comment and a one, one sort of question. First of all, I just have to say, Dr. Phillips, that if you were getting informed consent 20 years ago, I'm very proud of you. <laughs> Number two, um, I heard you, uh, Ruth, talk about uninformed decline. What about the informed and badgered sometimes decline? I mean, there are people who know that they don't want to have a test, and they still are asked over and over and over again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the goal is to have the informed either acceptor or the informed decline. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think I it's... Just seen they're all uninformed. I think we have to be careful about that, Elizabeth, because I think that it happens, but doctors are so busy and have so little time in general, I don't know how much badgering really is being done these days. I've, I infrequently hear those stories anymore. I think it does happen, and there are stories about it, but people turn it down with their OB, and they move on. So I think, again, we need evidence before we, we worry how often that happens, because in the way we the way we determine informed choice is we would consider that an informed choice. If she understood the information and it wasn't for her, that's an informed decline. The, I agree with you, but ten, the, the women I heard from were women who had an abnormal baby, and they were asked over and over again. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. So I had a quick question about um, the potential for digitized or electronic informed consent and, you know, potentially interactive informed consent. What do you guys feel about the, uh, the future of that, especially with whole, ge whole genome sequencing? <laughs> I, I don't know what other, well, I don't know what other resources we have available. You know, I, I agree with Dina that taking advantage of people who are superb educators and know how to do this well needs to be done. And I, I mean, why it hasn't been done earlier, but I think the kids who are growing up now and are on the internet all the time know how to resource and access and things. And my, yeah, exactly. A game. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we do have evidence that women, women, couples can learn through brochure, through a Absolutely. counselor, through uh, uh, all sorts of mechanisms. Absolutely. Thank you. Is that your career? <laughs> no, I'm a bioethics student. I, uh, Go for it. Uh, <laughs> you have a career now. You can I? <laughs> you have time Patty, can for I one just more question? Okay. okay. Actually, this is kind of a comment and a question. Um, so first of all, I think that when we're talking about Down syndrome testing and that paradigm, one test, um, and where we're going, forget even about whole genome sequencing, just these panels now, and what impact that has to what it means to really get informed decisions, and I want to link back to Georgia who said, well, I don't really do this. You do, because what we're going to see increasingly is cancer genetics tied into prediction. Oh, I didn't say that we're not going to do it. Yeah, we are that's, going. It's, we, act, it's already it being is, discussed. It that is correct. That panels, is correct. That was my point, yes. Right, and some of the panels prenatally will be looking at adult onset disorders, mm -hmm. and they'll, so we're right. going to have it all wrapped up together. So one... Um, insight one of you had, which I thought was a great insight, is actually the more and more tests we do, the less and less we're going to be able to really do informed consent. I mean, there's a real um, irony, I think, in all that. So I would encourage us to think, do a lot more research and scholarship in, in that particular area. And, and then the other point I wanted to pick up, um, and I think it's been said, but I'd like to reiterate it, about doing it earlier and if you talk about doing it earlier in the context of one test um, or for a, a diagnosis of Down syndrome, it's one thing. But if you talk about doing a lot of genetic tests earlier on that might on their own um, be spontaneous abortions, then I just wanted to emphasize the point of intention and the ambivalence or the burden additionally. That I don't have an answer to this. Um, but for us to just think a little deeper about that, I mean, that it means that 
women may be having to choose or feel the pressure to choose earlier on in a pregnancy, in that first trimester, um, to make a decision that might otherwise be made for them. And so I just want us not to lose track of that. Good point. Mm -hmm. We have time for perhaps one more question. Yes. Um, so in my other sort of life, when I'm not doing genetic stuff, I do a lot of informed consent stuff. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about decision aids. And a lot of you have mentioned, like, why haven't these been done? Why? I mean, and, and there's a whole universe of, of very well-studied decision aids for a wide range of other um, conditions and disease disorders and um, decisions that people have to make with respect to treatment that have been, and most of them are in video form, and they walk people through um, a whole host of decisions, how to understand the different kinds of risks, and they've basically um, done a lot of, they put a lot of thought into how to evaluate these kinds of decision aids and getting certification bodies together in order to say that they truly are unbiased. And I haven't seen any of, any of these translate into genetic counseling, but I think it might be something that would be really worthwhile to sort of try and bridge that gap. There is one um, by Miriam Cooperman. Yeah, but, okay. Um, okay. An excellent um, yeah. decision aid that she's developed looking at all the, the majority of the tests that are available during pregnancy. Really fabulous. But it's How often is it used? It's, it really was aimed primarily, I'll shout it to my phone, at um, it was developed as a research tool to see if that sort of education was effective and was framed around Down syndrome screening specifically as one disease that we could sort of get our arms around. Uh, but it's not available at this point, and she's struggled a little bit with industry partnerships and how to, how to move it forward. It was quite effective, and it led to some of the data that drove the ACOG uh, changes in terms of recommendations on, on test availability. There are a lot of decision aids on the Ottawa Decision Center um, from Annette O'Connor. She developed uh, decision aids that have been used in many, many different settings. And there's several up there that are on genetic counseling and that are used, and our students use them. I did an intervention study with one of them. The problem is what your outcomes are. You can increase knowledge consistently in many of them, but um, it's not clear how they affect attitudes. They ask a values clarification question, but they don't, there's no evidence about how they actually affect change or address attitudes, so, um, or values, I'm sorry. So they're limited. If you accept a definition that increased knowledge is sufficient to make an informed choice, they're effective. I don't buy that. So I what think they're still limited. Like, what about reducing decisional regret? Because I know that that's been tested quite a bit in sort of decisional satisfaction and reducing. But one thing, so just mm -hmm. as something that maybe could come out mm -hmm. of is that Talk in oh, the, mind. the ACA um, has a whole lot of opportunities for funding to sort of put forward pilot programs aimed at decision aids and improving informed consent and that kind of choice. So maybe that's something that people want to. I think. Down. Yeah. Oh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, sorry, the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, the, but yeah, as provided it gets through June. But I think you should combine that idea with the idea that came up earlier: is are there electronic versions of that 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 people could do? Because the more inter, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I think one of the challenges with those as well is that um, a decision aid may lead in decreased uptake. So if you have a test That's out good. there that people yeah, that want, which is good, it's a good, but if, you, if there are people out there trying to encourage that a test be done more frequently to get results, and a decision aid might educate someone enough, they say, I don't want to do it. Well, that's a good thing if, they, again, they make that informed choice either for or against. But if you're trying to justify to someone who might be trying to uh, promote a new so test where they want people to do it or yeah, encourage exactly. more people to do testing, you might turn more people away by doing that. So it's sometimes there's a hard argument to make about the justifications. But I save money, which I am so sorry um, to, uh, to end this conversation, but like Ruth said, we have a break from now until 4.30, and we can continue our conversation during the break. Thank you.